Okay, I only have, I think, one slide with text. So um, we're gonna try to keep everybody a little more awake. Greg and Fernando, in 2006, we were together in the second leadership class, and it's nice to, I feel like we're the matriarch and patriarch here of this group. Um, you're the, you're, you're, the, the, it was the young leadership group at that point. And Fernando and I were well known for being the loudest and the funnest of the, of the group. So I was the final chair of the BPH guidelines uh, committee. During that time, I had absolutely no conflicts. Um, and I believe in what we did, but I do believe that the guidelines need an overhaul and they're calling for a new panel, as you all know, if you've seen those emails, and I encourage people to think about it. Um, but if we're talking about laser enucleation, it is one of the panel statements and the EAU also recommends it. Uh, you know, I've been when I started doing a nucleation, I was one of three people in the United States who were doing it. So uh, it's been a long, long journey. We are not now as vested in industry as it was back then. Um, and I think that we all sort of understand the idea of a nucleation. But what I want to talk about over this next, you know, eight minutes and 40 seconds is you know, Fernando said it at the beginning, what the goal was of this is in this conference is not to necessarily talk about data. I'm not gonna give you any data. I'm gonna give you Lori's, what I've come across over the last almost 30 years um, that I've been doing this. And I think that understanding anatomy is important. So no, I do not do a truss on every patient. And no, I do not do a cysto on every patient. But I do have something. It's just that it's different what that something is with every patient. I work at a VA. You have a CAT scan for bloody nose. You have an abdominal and pelvic CAT scan. They don't even get your head. I have MRIs for PSAs. So all of those things, those tools are available and I am fiercely, fierce advocate of accountability to the taxpayer. We spend too much money on healthcare. So I am not a big proponent of over-testing for the sake of over-testing. I believe that you do the testing to inform your decisions and that's responsible. But I don't think we need to do things just because we need to do things. So in my case, you're gonna see a lot of imaging of CAT scans and MRI because that's what I have. So you need to understand the anatomy. Now when you're talking aquablation, when you're talking about any of these other things, we keep talking total prostate size, and what we need to understand is we're treating the transition zone, and it varies. Some patients have a very thick peripheral zone. If you do a lot of prostate MRI for prostate cancer, you know that. So you're not always gonna have a 75% defect. It may be a 20% defect. It may be a 80% defect. It really is dependent upon how much of the central zone they have in relation to their peripheral zone. So I try to really steer away from the idea of talking total prostate size. So if you have an MRI, you have a truss, you should be able to look at what is your central zone. Um, Kevin was talking about that as well. And what is actually your peripheral zone, like you can see in this middle one here, is my mouth showing? Yeah. You see more peripheral zone than you see central zone. Over here, you see almost all central zone. Now, I learned in the tri-lobar process of the, you do a middle lobe and then you do the lateral lobes. Now, of course, things have evolved over time. I am not very good at doing the end block. A lot of people are. I'm really terrible at teaching the end block because I get very frustrated that they do not hear my brain when I'm trying to tell them what to do. So I ended up defaulting to at least doing a middle lobe and then an end block or a middle lobe with one side and then the other side because if the residents don't have good flow, then none of us are having a good day. I can deal with poor flow at the beginning when they're obstructed, but but they can't. And so I, I and therefore if they can't, I can't, and it's not a fun day. So um, I do tend to do the trilobar probably more than a lot of other people, but that's the only way we did it at the beginning. And you know, maybe I, I can't learn differently. But these are the two types of modifications of end block that you see. So there's the end block that starts down in the seven o'clock position, goes anteriorly and comes down over to the five o'clock position and it actually can take the middle lobe with you. But then you can get this big donut that gets free and it kind of is there and you can't find your way back into the lumen. So you'll need to make an incision at some point. Um, I favor making an incision first as opposed to an incision later. Nicole Miller talks about how she gets it raised up and then she makes the incision. I will do more like this where I will make an incision at five or seven and then I'll incorporate this. But I come across the top. So uh, maybe more of a horseshoe. Now, why is anatomy important? Because 
how you approach these prostates are different. So here's an MRI. This is what you see. He doesn't have a lot of prostate back here in his actual pelvis. He's got a bunch in his bladder. So what you choose to do and how you choose to treat this patient, whether it's any of the things we're talking about here today, I would tell you I think this patient would be great for a TUR, great for a denucleation, because you can really focus where you're putting your energy into that part that is actually protruding into the bladder. And you're aware of where your trigone is and you don't have a lot of anterior tissue. You really see a lot behind you um, and that is more of that middle lobe or more asymmetrical lateral lobe. Now, what, now this is a patient I did. This is a guy who had a 300 gram prostate. And so one of the things I am is extremely honest. So you're gonna see some of the things that I haven't done well and that's fine, that's how we all learn. But if you're looking at this from an axial view, so if this, if this, well, this is coronal, but in a different view, you would just see this prostate all here. You would not know until you got into the sagittal view that what that actually is is anterior tissue. So understanding what the problem is, it's super important. So I did a really nice job of preserving back here at his sphincter. I didn't take tissue much like what Granville's talking about with the TUR, you know, I molded, I actually cut into tissue here, maybe other people don't, I do, you can see I left tissue here and here, but I definitely under-resected his anterior lobe, so when he came back in obstructed, it's because that anterior is dropping. So I think aquablation would be terrible here, because we don't get anterior tissue. So I think understanding anatomy, if I tell you nothing else more, even for a nucleation, and maybe particularly for a nucleation, aquablation is really essential to understand what it is that you're going after. So here's a patient, so now you're talking about an elevated bladder neck. So when you're doing an enucleation, how you might unblock that based on, you can see here, here's the bladder neck, it's all up here. What you have to be really careful is it's a butternut. You all know what a butternut squash is, right? So, you know, it comes out and then it goes in. So coming around behind the other side can be very challenging in these big glands. You have to roll it in. That's what you have to learn how to roll it in so that you can get your laser behind there. If you just come laterally and keep going straight, you're gonna really give them a wide bladder neck. And so I remember going to a talk from the oncologist um, at Indiana who said every time he had to do a radical prostatectomy after a ligament and nucleation, he'd have to reconstruct the bladder neck. So be cautious of making sure that you're molding and coming in when you do your nucleation. Prostate stones. So stones tend to live back by the viru. So if you're dealing with infection and you can get into these crypts, you know that that's probably your limit of where you're going to go. Um, I see a lot of patients with recurrent UTIs, and you can see you get into these prostate stones right, right back by the viru. And sometimes you do have to come back with a laser to get to that point, and you might leave it if you're actually doing some sparing of the viru. But they also can go into the seminal vesicles as well. So just be aware that, that if you get into these stones, that should be the limit of where you enucleate. Now, this is a patient I did about three weeks ago. He has almost no prostate down here. Almost His entire prostate lives almost entirely in his bladder. I have no shame in saying that I did a cystotomy to take this out. Sometimes I get criticized by my own colleagues and peers saying, why wouldn't you morselate? Because I'm not morselating, right? Like, I'm, I'm just going to call it like it is. Like, I, we stuck a hand in there, and we pulled out a uterus out of this man's bladder, basically, um, with lots of fibroids. And so very nodular prostate that completely lives inside the bladder. Know your anatomy and think about what you're going to do. But this enucleation was really, really easy. It was just at the bladder neck. Like, it was so easy to enucleate it. And then we just did a cystotomy, and we took it out. Now. This segues into the nodular prostate. So one of the problems that can happen with a nucleation is you can chase a nodule and you're not at the capsule. So here's a case where there's a zero peripheral zone, all central zone, very nodular prostate, no fat, and it can be very deceiving where you are. So that can trip you up in some of these that you're not actually at the surgical capsule and you're chasing a nodule. So just kind of keep your bearings. Um, sometimes you have to kind of come back and figure out where you are. And then we'll sort of end here. This is this creation of a wide bladder neck. So here's a patient who was TUR'd. So what you can't really see in the snow globe of pyuria here, this was the margin of his bladder neck after his TUR. And then he grew tissue sort of mid-gland projecting into the bladder. We've all seen that. So if I go and enucleate that, that's how big his bladder neck is going to be, not because I'm doing anything, but because that's how it was. And of course, look at what I did with this guy. So you can see I did come in. I came in here, 
and didn't make his bladder neck as wide as it could be, um, but that does happen with a nucleation. Post-op stress urinary incontinence, so this is a guy I did, 250 gram prostate, this is what I left him with. I left tissue back here, I did everything right, but unfortunately he had SUI. So this is a patient you guys will hear more about, but I did a ProAct in him. Um, this was right at the time of the balloons when we first placed him. This was at his first inflation. This is after his second and he's totally continent. So we do make stress incontinence, I'm not gonna lie, and we'd all be lying up here if we said that we never had a patient with stress incontinence.